All right, episode 25. I did mention on the last episode, it was episode 25, and that was a bit of a faux pas from me. So for everyone playing at home, this is actually episode 25. And what better way to do it than have a superstar guest on uh, that lots of people in our community have asked to hear from. Uh, and I'm really excited to welcome our guest on episode 25, Troy Hunt. Troy is, as you, I am hope you're aware, is the founder and creator of Have I Been Pwned, which is what he's mostly known for. But Behind the scenes, Troy is a really interesting character who does a lot for the community. He does the Yaman's work for cybersecurity more broadly and has a really interesting background that we'll get into shortly. A couple of housekeeping, Gabe isn't with us again today. She and the team are over on leave in Bali. So shout out to them on a retreat in Bali. Um, I missed the memo for the dark mode holiday. So Gabe will be back with us on the next episode, but for now, she's let me go rogue again with Troy. So Troy, welcome to the show, my friend. G'day, mate. Thank you for having me. No problem at all. Look, I just want to go through a bit of a background. I've got my notes on this screen over here, so you'll see going across to this side as well. Now, I found your Wikipedia intro kind of interesting. <laughs> I want to get your reaction live to it. This is the Wikipedia intro that I thought it'd be fun to read out. Troy Adam Hunt is an Australian web security consultant known for public education and outreach on security topics. He created Have I Been Pwned, a data breach search website that allows users to see if their personal information has been compromised. He has also authored several popular security related courses on Pluralsight and regularly presents keynotes and workshops on security topics. He created a safer web tool, which formally performed automated security analysis on ASP.NET websites. That's a, it's a pretty impressive little paragraph to intro you into Troy, but since that's been written, I have no doubt there's been a lot more that's happened since then, which I just found out. And I'd love to talk about straight away is <laughs> you've just released a book. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Wikipedia is funny. I learned early on that if there's something wrong, you can't fix it yourself. Uh, and I, I learned that because I got like a, a very polite, stern message as you seem to be the person who is editing this page about yourself. Yeah, look, it's, uh, it, it's just an interesting selection of things to be at the front in a bio because some of it I think is pretty irrelevant and then some of the really good stuff is not there. But yeah, like one of the things not on here is the book and I hear this was news to you as well. Yeah. As, as we said, just before we came on air, like I, I worked on this for years and delayed it and then I published it and then right after that I went away and got married and then went on a honeymoon and just didn't talk about it at all. I'm meant to be talking about it. <laughs> it's time. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> So what is it? What's the book? Give us, give the audience a look. I know that a few people will like me be purchasing it after they listen to the episode. Yeah. So look, the idea is there's a good friend of mine in the tech industry is a guy called Rob Connery and he's very well known in sort of .NET development circles. And he's done a lot of really cool stuff before, really amazing podcasts, some great frameworks. He built the Subsonic ORM, which was really popular back in the day, works for Microsoft at the moment, been through all sorts of other interesting things. Started Tech Pub, a company that got acquired by Pluralsight, who I've created a lot of content for. And everything he always built was just awesome. And he, he did this book a few years ago called The Imposter's Handbook. So for people who wanted to learn about tech and it, it just, it went gangbusters. Everyone loved it. And then a, a few years ago, he said, hey, you've got a lot of interesting blog posts. I bet there's more to it. Like I bet there was a story behind it. There was something that you, that prompted you to do this that you didn't write about. And then there are probably a lot of interesting stuff that happened afterwards. And I was like, yeah, there, there was. So things like, when I, I left my job at Pfizer, actually it was even better than leaving my job. I got made redundant, which is much better when they ask you to go. Cause they're like, please go. Here's a pile of money. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Thanks for coming. Um, but I wrote about my departure and I was like very polite about it. And in the back of my mind, I'm like Homer Simpson driving over the bridge. just like throwing the torch. <laughs> behind him. So no, I won't do that. I didn't have my redundancy payout at that time. But yeah, there, there just was some really sketchy stuff behind it. You know, this in this book, I talk about, you know, what it was that was just absolutely driving me nuts that I couldn't say publicly. And then things like the, I did a lot of stuff around the Ashley Madison data breach. There's a bunch of other stuff that happened there. I couldn't say publicly. And through the period of time and I don't know, statutes, limitations, something like that. <laughs> now it's, this is what happened. And then there's just a bunch of intro of my background and some nice intros from other people in the industry. And, and Rob wanted to self-publish it. He said, that's what he's had success with. So yeah, we put it out there. It's self-published. It's at book.troyhunt.com and it seems to be going really well, which is great news. That's amazing. Congratulations on that. Firstly, I'll put the link to Troy's book in the show notes so that we can make sure that our lovely community get behind your book. It sounds 
I'll be getting it for sure. I've been a fan of yours for a long time. We happened to meet through our previous life uh, at an event. And since then, Troy lives on the Gold Coast as well. Uh, so another fine purveyor of the Gold Coast, which, uh, which I love. I didn't realize, Troy, that you grew up with the Gold Coast. Is that, am I right there? No, you're wrong. It's not ah, on the Wikipedia page yeah. either. Yeah. It's only someone who got those details right. I, know. I was a bit all, all over the place. So I, I started life in very sort of country Victoria which mm. for international folks is where people leave. It's probably a fair <laughs> way of putting it. But my dad was a pilot. We lived in country Victoria until I was nearly 14. And then we went up going to the Netherlands for a couple of years. So I had two years there. And then we went to Singapore for a few years. And then mum and dad didn't want me meeting Singaporean girls and just being in Singapore forever. <laughs> so, <laughs> so when I finished school, I finished high school in Singapore and moved to the Gold Coast with my parents because this is where they wanted to be. Yeah. And Spent a bit of time here, a bit of time in, in London, and then 14 years in Sydney. So that was for like 14 years of trying to get out of there <laughs> and then moved back to here in 2015. So now I, I was an adult before I lived here, but yeah, ever since I got here, it's, this is home. And every time I've lived somewhere else, it's like, I just want to get home. And where I laughingly said before, if I move anywhere in the future, it's going to be within a few hundred meters and that's it. Cause not only do I love the Gold Coast, I love where we live here and it's just, it's amazing. Yeah. That's fantastic. I have a similar story. I spent 12 years in Sydney and spent majority of that trying to get back to the Gold Coast. It's, it's always, <laughs> you know, you know I grew, it's like... exactly. I grew up in country Queensland and my folks bought on the Gold Coast many moons ago. And, you know, when you just go back to that place and it's always got happy memories and you just think that's, that's home. When we got back here, it just, everything felt like it, it sunk in. So I appreciate that. Now, Troy's only down the road. I'm hopefully going to catch up with Troy for a beer in the not too distant future. I'm just going to throw that out on live so totally. that uh, it, yeah, totally. it make it happen. Look, yeah, so talk me through your dad was a pilot. How did you get into, tell us the origin story. How did Troy get into tech? I know that you got your first job at Genesis on the Gold Coast when you came back here. Uh, Is that previous really. to that? Was that, this stuff this, that's on that LinkedIn. Even... That's on LinkedIn, Troy. You're killing it... me here. Ah, uh, that's me. 1995, <sighs> Gold Coast, I got to get back to LinkedIn. Yeah. I got to rewrite some history. That didn't work <laughs> out so well. That's in the book. So... <laughs> I, I'd always wanted to be a, a pilot like my dad, cause I thought it was cool. Like we, we'd at least up until nine 11, it was cool. <laughs> like we'd, I remember when we were living in the Netherlands, he'd go, Hey, I'm going to Greece today. Do you want to go to Greece? Yeah. Okay. I'll go to Greece. So he would like, I don't think he ever booked tickets or anything. We just walk into the airport and he's, I'm the captain. He's with me. <laughs> so I just, I'd sit in the jump seat. We'd fly down to Greece a couple of hours down there. We walk around, kick the tires, get in the plane and come back. But it was still an era where pilots were like revered I like that. they were amazing and he'd been in the air force for years before that as well and flying jets and choppers and all sorts of stuff so he was it seemed really cool and then i think i was probably around about the time i got to singapore when i was just before i turned 16 and he was like you really don't want to be in this industry anymore <laughs> it's a lot of cost cutting and all the rest of it and being in Singapore, I had access to technology, which was technology beyond what we would have, what we had in the Netherlands before that and places like Australia as well. And it was just a very tech centric place. And I just started getting in, basically getting into PCs, like mucking around, playing, and doing all the stuff that people listening to this have probably done, breaking games, <laughs> all the rest of it. And my first actual job in, in tech was I got a, a part-time job at a satellite systems engineering company. And it was literally just doing hardware repairs. It was really basic stuff, but it was a satellite company. And, it was, and then I started doing just PC education stuff for other expat families because this was like 92 93 94 and people were starting to get pcs in the home and they had encyclopedia and carter but they didn't know how to use it <laughs> so i'd be like going and helping out families for a few bucks an hour or whatever it was and that's where i started by the time i was getting towards the end of high school and i had to make a decision about university i went ah oh, just I'll go and do computer science. And I did. So that I went to, and you would have seen this problem on my LinkedIn. I went to Griffith <laughs> Uni and started doing computer science in, in 95. But the interesting thing about all that is that, and this is in the intro of the book, this is my sorted history, which wasn't quite clear. I started doing computer science. I wanted to do stuff for the web because 95 was when we just started to see the web a lot. And I was like, this is awesome. I'll just do courses in uni about web development. And then this would be cool. And you couldn't do it because there was nothing. There was just like, it was too early. So I literally went and bought HTML for dummies. It's, it's in my cupboard over here, like the big yellow book. Yeah. And I remember sitting on a bus to my grandmother's just like flicking through. Most of it's still relevant too. This is really weird. Like other than blink and marquee tags, everything there is still pretty much relevant. And I started building software. And the, what, what I explain in the book is I ended up 
getting sucked into this. I think investment company is the wrong way to put it. It was horse racing. <laughs> <laughs> but you're from the Gold Coast. Yeah. <laughs> You'd have heard of these stories. So anyway, there's a company there doing horse racing stuff. And I got sucked into this along with my girlfriend at the time who was doing a lot of the coding. And it, it failed spectacularly, got investigated by ASIC, our Securities and Investment Commission. The company name you mentioned went bankrupt. They actually did, did it go back? I can't remember the right word for it. It's dead. It's yeah. gone. Yeah. I escaped bankrupt. This is like in my very early twenties, I had no idea what I was doing, but that kind of set the course for everything else. Cause it was an absolute disaster, but it, I learned a lot from it. Let's put it that way. No doubt. No doubt. So that company's gone bust. You're 20 something years old and early on in your career. Where do you turn? So I, I ended up going to the UK and this was sort of the tail end of .com. So this was 99, I went to the UK and it was, it was a good time for tech, right? It was just the very tail end of the good time for tech. And I ended up working for a, a company there called uh, Proxycom. And then they got acquired by a company called Clarion. It was all dev stuff. And I was doing a lot of front end development. So I did a lot of the front end for a, a UK bank called Kahoot. And I think from memory, it was like the first online bank at the time. Mm -hmm. And it was, I think it was backed by Abbey National. Long, long time ago. But anyway, I did a lot of the front end for this and did that for a year and then came back to Oz and went to Sydney because there was just a lot more opportunity for work in Sydney as you than yeah. what there was on the Gold Coast. It's not like today where there's just so much remote work. It's like you have to be present. And I went and built interactive TV interfaces for, I think, a, just under a year because I've been doing a lot of ITV in the UK, which is basically like HTML just for a small screen, yeah. <laughs> <You> know, HTML <laughs> and JavaScript. And then went to Pfizer and spent 14 years at Pfizer. And you enjoyed a really great career at Pfizer by the, uh, by the looks. And I've spoken to you briefly about your time there when we met earlier on. So it was about that time or in, in the Pfizer years where you yourself got breached, which led to the ultimate creation of Have I Been Bad? I was in the Adobe breach twice. And it's interesting the way it all unfolded. And a lot of this comes through in the chronology of the book. This is not all meant to be book plug, by the way, but you're literally asking questions. <laughs> I love it, yeah. <laughs> this is, we didn't orchestrate this. This is great. <laughs> I was getting, I went there in a development capacity and I was doing classic ASP at the time as in 2001 and then pivoted into ASP.net and very Microsoft stack code and stuff. But at one point in there, what happens to so many of us in the industry happened to me where they're like, if you would like to progress in your career, you need to stop writing code and manage people. And so, well, I don't, I didn't just put it like that. I don't like managing. This is not what I do. And I ended up managing like guys in China, which is just, it was so not me in, in every possible way because I had no interaction and there's a lot of barrier and communication and all the rest of it. Mm. And, and they made me an arch architect. I can't do it without air quoting. If you listen to this <laughs> later on architect and which is basically a way of paying you some more money to <laughs> still do pretty much the same stuff, but I really missed that the hands-on stuff. And th this sort of got me into writing the blog in 2009, because I just missed doing stuff and going to office. I'd have a lot of meetings. Jeez, I had a lot of meetings, a lot of meetings, a lot of, it wasn't a lot of travel, but yeah, you'd go and you'd do team building and let's build a castle out of spaghetti and you'll all work better together. And it's just, ugh, it just sapped my soul. <laughs> so I start writing this blog. And somehow it just becomes more security. So like, I didn't know what I was going to do with it. I just thought oh, I'd be a good idea, but it became a little bit more security centric. And then I got quite interested in data breaches and I'd write about things like the Sony pictures data breach. And isn't it interesting? There's the Sony pictures data breach and the Gorka data breach and a whole bunch of people who are in both use the same password. So, yeah. Okay. We all know this, but empirical evidence is in. And I thought it was very interesting too, where I've been used to building a lot of systems and it's like your own little ecosystem, your own little sort of secretive behind the browser, backend code and database design and decisions about everything from security to performance. And then a data breach should happen. And it just like, it peels back the curtain and you can see everything that people have done. And you look at it and you go, why the hell did they do this? This is actually, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a little almost a little bit voyeuristic, isn't it? Like I get to see what's happening behind the veneer. So I found data breach is really interesting. And when the Adobe breach came along and I found me in there twice, once my personal address, once my Pfizer address, I was like, this, how, why am I in here? Because I knew what Photoshop was, but as far as I didn't have an Adobe account, but I was a big Macromedia Dreamweaver user and then Adobe acquired Macromedia, my data flowed somewhere else. And that kind of posited that question about if I don't know, 
where I've been exposed. Other people probably don't know. And I wanted to write some code because I was frankly bored. Why don't I write something and I'll do it on Azure. I'll do it on platform as a service and I'll use modern storage paradigms like table storage instead of a big fat relational database. I'll blog about it and I'll learn some stuff I can introduce to Pfizer as well. So it was like a, a duality where it was like, okay, I want to build a data breach service, but I also just really want to build something. And that's what sort of spurned the whole thing. It was a very accidental initiative, really. And it's, I know the answer to some of these questions because we've talked about it previous, but I know that our audience might not. Now, I want to take you, you mentioned potentially it was a bit accidental at the time of you were creating it for X, but then it's since then it's become this huge platform and database that is leveraged by government organizations and mm. technology leaders of the globe. You mentioned accidental. Now talk us through the story of have I been pwned, how it's spelled because <laughs> it's P-W-N-E-D. So it's not the traditional spelling of pwn or pawned. It's uh, you've spelled that in a way when you first created it. Talk us through that story of how it I came to be. I thought traditional is. spelling. Have I got well, it wrong? No. <laughs> Have I been getting it wrong all these oh, no. years? What's happened? Yeah. No, I think I'm right because I've thought about it a lot. But no, I think I'm right because it's meant to be a misspelling of own. It it's meant yes. to be instead of O-W-N-E-D. It's P-W-N-E-D. But just to be safe, I've got so many variations of the name in, in part because people do screw it up. So I've got, have I been pawned? Spelt exactly as it sounds like it's spelled. Yeah. Have I been prawned? Because for some reason, someone on a US TV show was talking about that. So I was like, all right, I got to get that domain. <laughs> and then all these hyphenated versions, because it ends up in a, like a print newspaper and gets broken in two with a hyphen in the middle of it. Like, oh, crap, I got to get that one as well. So I got, I think there's 50 something domains of various TLDs and various things. But when I picked the name, even in 2013, it was hard to buy a domain name.com for just about anything. So I was like, I kind of remember the different versions I tried, but then I got to that one. I was like, oh yeah, that'll be fine. It's available. No, I was going to use it anyway. It doesn't really matter. And now it's just become this, it's almost like the word pwned has become synonymous with the service. In fact, the book is called pwned. I end up just like, bam, pwned. So, okay. Everyone will know what that is. And it's funny now because every now and then someone pops up and they're like, now you really should change that name because people don't understand it. It doesn't sound like it's a serious enough thing. And uh, I think that people would think you're a more sort of serious business person. If you, oh, okay, you've just convinced me to leave it. Exactly. Yeah, as it is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. And I have no doubt that you've probably had that multiple times where people have tried to get you to oh, change yeah. that. Look, it's used now, it's, as I said before, it's used by governments from Australia to the US across the rest of the globe. And you've got vendor tech partners leveraging it for their services crowdstrike okta i know regionally kogan so everyone might have shot with kogan mm -hmm. before it's leveraged in the kogan stack as well yeah. has it been a shock to you how much it's been picked up over the time over the years the, uh, the great thing about examples like kogan and i only know because someone else mentioned it is that they're using the pwn passwords api so there's an api in there which which sits on top of, I think it's 850 million something passwords at the moment, which is contributed to by the FBI and the NCA. So they pump passwords in, they've got this ingestion pipeline and it's intended to be there to try and help organizations block known bad passwords. But forget about how many uppercases and lowercases and everything else. Let's look at what's actually getting abused out there. And there's a great anonymity API that allows you to query it without disclosing anything about the password itself in any usable way. So all of these organizations have taken on board and I'm going to look at this while we're talking because I haven't checked mm. this for a month, but we're up like over a billion requests every month to this API from organizations of all different kinds. And because there's no auth, there's no registration, there's no anything that you need to do in order to use it. I've got no idea who's using the thing, which is great. And to be honest, one of the only ways I can figure out to a my way into this, one of the only ways I can figure out who's actually using it is if they have integrated it into their web application and you can then go through and see referrer headers. And yes. so, okay, I can see there's been a request from such and such an organization. So I know they're using it. Now, because there are no controls over it, it does get used by all sorts of orgs. And without disclosing too much about which government, there was something I published a little while ago that was Western government related. And I was giving examples of who's using it. And this, let's just say it was earlier this year but one of the top users is a name that everyone recognized, which I put in the draft blog post. 
And then this Western government said, can you maybe remove the Kaspersky reference? <laughs> and I, Look, I do feel a little bit sorry for Kaspersky because inevitably there are a bunch of really wonderful people working there, but, but political situation being what it is at the moment, that was not going to be a good choice. So the, I guess the point is that anyone can come along and actually use the thing. And what's more than just the API, you can download all the data too. So if you download all the data, I, I genuinely have absolutely no idea who's consuming the passwords. Which is great because the whole idea is to try and ensure that there is anonymity. Now, I can't see how much has been loaded in the last week because Crowdflare is crashing. crashing. <laughs> I know Again. that there are 76 million requests in the last, the last 24 hours, wow. which, is, which is cool. So what's that extrapolate out to? That's over 2 billion a month now. Yeah. Yeah, that escalated quickly. <laughs> I didn't even notice. <laughs> but this is also the nice thing about the design of this. It's massively cached at Cloudflare. So... Out of the, where are we? So request caching. If I look at the total volume of requests, it's about 99.9% .9 of all requests are just cached at the edge at Cloudflare. So whether it's 1 billion, 2 billion, 20 billion, it really doesn't make much difference to me. Mm. Wow. Does that put strain on the infrastructure sitting in the back end? No, because it's from cache. So Cloudflare has got, I think they're approaching 300 edge nodes around the world. Right. The way the password K anonymity model works is, and it's all, Documenters, it's not too complex. It's basically get a password, SHA-1 hash the password, take the first five characters of the SHA-1 and then query the API for that. And then you get back every hash that matches the entire password. So then the client can go the whole hash. And the, and the anonymity bit is if you only have the first five characters of a hash, you've got a, if we consider hash collisions as well, you've got like an infinite number of passwords that it could be. So we preserve anonymity. But because it's only five hexadecimal characters, you've only got 16 to the power of five different possible queries, which is only just over a million. So long story short, you end up with one and a bit million possible queries, and then they just get massively cached on all these edge nodes. So if I do, let's say round numbers, I do a million queries and mm -hmm. only 0.1% of them have to go through to the origin. That's only like a thousand requests that I've got to support from an origin server, which runs on serverless infrastructure and just picks it up from a blob with no database lookup overhead or anything like that. So it's enormously efficient, which is why we can just scale it to the moon. That's phenomenal. That's, that's really cool. Shows the power of the cloud, right? It's a combination of the power of the cloud. If I look back to the way I originally used all the cloud paradigms, particularly platform as a service, they were really good, but then I kept finding various bottlenecks. Platform as a service on Azure was great in that you'd have a small web app instance and you'd get a box, virtual box, it's like that big, but it's platform as a service. So if your utilization went too high, you could scale out and you'd get another box and then another box and another box. And it all sounded wonderful until one day, <laughs> Have I Been Pwned was like on British primetime TV. And what's really interesting about the usage patterns when you're on TV as opposed to just in a news article or something, is imagine you've got you know, 10 million people sitting around on their couches in the UK and this thing comes up and it was on a really popular program. This thing comes up and there's the URL. And then you get a million of those people all pick up their device at the same time and type it in. So your traffic patterns are just, it's not like hockey stick or anything like that. It's like literally right angle. Yeah. And you massively exhaust all your resources before they have the time to scale. So I lost traffic. And I wrote about all this as I went, because I found it super interesting. So now this is why a lot of stuff has been rolling over to serverless, runs on servers, <laughs> but, but <laughs> it is a more direct line between the usage of the service and your wallet. It's look, we've got lots of servers. We're just going to provision requests all over the place and you just pay for what you use. And that's been great. And then the, the next sort of evolution of that <clears throat> is what I've been really focusing on with Cloudflare, which is not just serverless, but let's run this serverless code on all the individual edge nodes. So every time you or I go to have I been pwned, like we're going to Brisbane and that's it. It's an hour that way by car. So the latency is pretty good and it's executing there and it's running there and it's returning stuff from there. And it very rarely has to go back to the origin from there. So yeah, cloud's great, but there's a lot of different ways of doing it too. And I think part of the fun part of have I been pwned is, is just been to find the most efficient way of making the thing work. Yeah, that's phenomenal. I love that. What's the size of the database currently? Give us rough figures, obviously we don't want to... <laughs> Divulge. I'm not really sure. And the reason I'm not really sure, I guess it depends on how you measure it. I know that there's almost 12 billion pwned accounts in there. I'm just looking at, have I been pwned now? That's the total number of people who've been breached. For each person who's been breached, on average, they're in about two breaches. I'm in something like 25. I'm doing very well. It's like golf, right? You yeah. lower your score. 
So if there's you know, an average of two per account, then there's really about 6 billion unique email addresses, which means 6 billion rows in Azure table storage. There's, there's not an easy way to report on that in terms of the total volume of data. Table storage, I think, has probably gone a little bit unloved. There are other ways of doing this. I need to make time to roll it over yeah, to, yeah. to newer paradigms, and I'll be able to better answer that question. <laughs> Amazing. We'll hold that space. Now, you, you, we started the conversation with APIs and, and how easy it is to connect to the Hubble Hub and database. I want to talk about, about APIs and for... The viewers that are Googling what API is, I'll give you a bit of context. And rather than my technical brain giving you a further technical dump, this is what it says if you Google API. So it is an application programming interface and it's a contract of service between two applications. It's probably the easiest way to describe it without getting too, too technical on the audience there. But I was at RSA conference this year, Troy, and one of the key themes was that we live in an API economy. I found that was pretty pretty interesting statement and we've seen we've all seen the benefits of apis but in more recent term regionally here in australia we've seen perhaps the negative effects on apis that aren't looked after through probably more <laughs> publicly the Opti, optus data breach so, um, so you should ask optus this question <laughs> absolutely they're, yeah they're stressing at the moment but give us your context on the api economy and how it is there's two sides to that story it's a double-edged sword Look, I always find it a little bit funny when people talk about APIs as though there's something completely different. There are HTTP requests that still conform to the same spec as a request that is to a web page. It returns a response. It has a header. It has a body. It's normally more curly braces than angle braces. But for all intents and purposes, it's basically all the same stuff. There's very little to separate it. And certainly in many programming languages, whether you're writing an API or a web page, a lot of it is very similar. And really, I think when we get to API, it's probably the biggest thing that's different as it relates to security is they're just that little bit further out of visibility. Like I'm looking at the Cloudflare dashboard here. I finally got my number up 2.24 billion in the last month. Oof. It's pretty cool. I can see a URL and I can see a number in the URL and I might be curious and change that number and it's Cloudflare. So it almost certainly be fine. But that's something which is very visible to me as an end user. It's very visible to testers. It's very visible to developers. We get an API and it's, okay, now it's sitting behind my mobile device. There, there's an abstraction layer. There's this rich client app that sits in front of it. And it's still making HTTPS requests over the back end. But it's just that bit further away. You can't see that it's just a number in the URL. You can't just go and easily tweak it. And I did a, a talk last night for the GoTo conference in Copenhagen, and I gave two examples of where APIs have just massively come undone. And one was Nissan had an app to control the Nissan Leaf EV. And I did a workshop in Oslo a few years ago. And long story short, someone found that the API key that they were using in the app, so the key, the secret, was printed in the windscreen of every car <laughs> because it was the VIN number. He found that just by proxying his app through his PC. He used a Fiddler on the PC. He loaded a self-signed root certificate from Fiddler so he could intercept HTTPS. So there was no uh, public key pinning or anything like that. And he's, oh, this looks curious. And a VIN number is innumerable. I wonder what happens if I change the number. Now I'm turning someone else's heater on. And then the other example, and I've still got the device here in my drawer, was these guys. These For folks listening, I'm holding a, a pink watch. <laughs> That's a kid's tracking watch. And this was communicating backwards and forwards to APIs with a family identifier, which was a number. It was obviously just a, a, an auto incrementing integer. And I was like customer 3,456 or something. And customer 3,455 was someone completely different. <laughs> and, and you could pull back the location of their child or relocate their child or add someone else to the child's account so that they could call your child. And these are like the most basic, simple, like insecure direct object reference sort of flaws and we've had them in the web as well. They exist in APIs, but they're just that little bit further away from immediate visibility. So I think we've got to get over the fact that there's somehow like a special beast, which is different, but they do tend to hide a little bit better. Yeah. It's almost like the cloak that, uh, that puts on the front end of it. I've heard you talk about the, is that the VTech watch? No, no. So VTech was a different problem. Yeah, that was a different so one. This is TikTok track. And I always laugh when I do this presentation because I'll see if it's still on their website. But they're, they're an Aussie startup and they are up in Brisbane 
and that the funny thing about their website is they lean really heavily on the Aussiness of it. And the original website, I see it says, we're on, we're creating a brand new website for our security devices. Oh, geez, don't do that. Oh, dear. <laughs> security <laughs> devices and services. We'll be back soon. Oh, my God. But the website was like, your data is securely hosted in Brisbane, Queensland. And I kind of always make this joke because imagine you've gone to a website and you're like, let's figure out if this thing is safe or not. And then you're like, oh, it's hosted in Queensland. <laughs> I must be fine then. <laughs> <laughs> They've got the best security. They'll be fine. What they didn't put on the website is that all the code was written and managed in Sri Lanka. And I don't have a problem at all with Sri Lanka, but that just didn't suit the narrative that they had. And it was a little bit of an unusual place to offshore in my my assumption, and I think it's reasonable, is that they've just gone to the cheapest possible market. Yep. And next minute, all your data's out there. Yeah, that was that was an interesting one. That one was that was 2000 and must have been 15 oh, I think or it was 16. 19. No, I think 19. It was, 19. It was later. It was much, much more recent than that. Um, my, my timeline since COVID has just completely gone out of whack. It is a bit of a blur, isn't it? <laughs> it is. So from there, you've done a lot of things with, with talks too. And correct me if I'm wrong again, you've testified in front of the US. I want to say the house or is it the Congress, but you, Congress? you've been in front yeah. of Congress and had to testify as a result of some of the breaches that you've been presenting and have I been pwned. How, what was the experience there? How did you get approached to do that? And then what was it like after? It's just so funny. Like the way the tide has turned on this over the years, because it's like when no one was looking at have I been pwned, it's like, ah, it's just data breaches. Yeah. No problems. I don't know if I meant to have it or not. It's probably fine. And then it starts getting a lot of attention and you're like, oh crap, that's a lot of illegally obtained data there. <laughs> yeah. And yes, I know like everyone has it, but I have a lot of it and yeah. I'm not hiding behind an identity. And then the, the tide started turning, I, I guess, in the lead up to testifying Congress in 2017. And as we've already mentioned now, it's 30 plus governments using it and FBI feeding data in and everything. But it was just really interesting to feel this shift of almost being like a taboo subject to come to Congress and sit in front of everyone. And I remember people at the time saying, they're just trying to get you to America so they can arrest you, don't you? Yeah, yeah. You won't come back. I don't want to go like all Marcus, Marcus Hutchins on this, but I think <laughs> like it, that would be an interesting story. If I get arrested, it's going to be a great blog post. But I, I didn't get arrested. And everyone was super, super nice. And in fact, not long after that, I'm between 2019, I went and did a talk at the, I forget the full name, but it was like the NYPD cybersecurity and counterterrorism conference right next to ground zero at 9-11. And wow. just like a room full of three letter acronym people. And I'm up there talking about all this stolen data. And then people come up later on and they're like, hi, I'm like inspector agent, you know, this, and they've got the badges and everything. I'm like, don't arrest me, don't arrest me. Yeah. Uh, it but it was really cool because they're like, hey, we use this all the time. This is actually a really useful thing. So if nothing else, I'd like to hope that the uh, Congress and the NYPD stuff and all the FBI bits have perhaps tried to find the highest and best possible use of events, which none of us want to happen. Like we don't want data breach. It'd be great to make have I been pwned completely useless. It's not going to happen, but that would be a good goal. So to be able to take it and go, okay, we can do something useful with this. And that's really cool. And I can't think of better endorsement than having the exposure to people like that. Yeah, absolutely. What sort of use cases did they leverage the platform for out of curiosity? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So the ones that came up in that NYPD event is they said they use it a lot for training, for education, mm -hmm. education and community outreach is a big one. And there's, I wrote a blog post some years ago called the legitimization of have I been pwned. And of course, there was a backstory behind that, which I didn't fully explain at the time, but it was partly because I was worried about the public perception of the legality of it. So I was, here are all the police departments talking about it and the government <laughs> agencies. And yeah, often I'll get a request. There was one the other day from a, it was like a county police department somewhere in the UK. They're like, hey, do you have any roll-ups or things that we can put at our conference with Have I Been Pwned so that people can come along and we're going to give them like a little private booth that they can go into and they can check if their email address has been breached. And they're using that I guess precisely as I wanted it to be used, which is here is a way for you to try and figure out if you've been exposed or not. And incidentally, this is also the reason why you get a result straight on the front page without having to verify you control the address, because there are so many use cases where there's this fleeting moment where you can get someone to enter an address, get immediate result and change their behavior. But yeah, whether have I been pwned returns the result to you, to you or not doesn't change the fact that you're in this breach and your data's out there amongst the worst possible people. But creating that awareness uh, is amazing. And I've seen it being done many times on TV, on various shows as well. They like sit down, put your email address in there. 
dangerous. It's been on it's been on Netflix series. It's been on How to Sell Drugs Online. It's really cool. <laughs> People were messaging me going, "Have I been playing on Netflix?" Oh, sweet, <laughs> that's neat. That escalated quickly. And even things like support departments. So I've heard many stories of support departments for particularly large brands where someone will call up and they'll say, uh, my account's been hacked. It's always my account's been yeah. hacked. You know? That's your fault, big retail store. And the operator will go, duh, duh, duh. did you know you've been in five different data breaches? Do you ever use the same username and password in multiple places? And you can just picture the person in there and going, oh crap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're a normal human. That's it. I've used it many times similarly. And back in my in military days, we used to leverage it for people that thought they had quite a secure front end with their digital ecosystem and their digital passport. And they presented an email address and we use things like, uh, have I been pwned to one work out if they've been breached. And then we use things like people, I don't know if you ever use PIPL yeah, yeah. to then target some of those accounts and follow through and then showcase how, yeah, how you might front end a strong digital ecosystem. But once you dig behind the curtain a little bit, it's, it's pretty poor really. Starts to unravel. And it's interesting how many different, like unexpected use cases there are. And, and uh, someone gave me one a little while ago where this was someone from a, a really well known brand everyone's heard of before. And when they launch a new product, it's so anticipated that loads of people try to jump on it as fast as they can, grab it, buy it, and then they'll resell it at twice the price or whatever. And, and they're an online retailer. So their challenge is how do we try and keep this, uh, these automated accounts out? And one of the things they found is that when these automated accounts are set up, they're taking the email address, they're sending it to the Have I Been Pwned API. If the email address has not been in a data breach, that raises their suspicion because we are all so pwned that if you're not pwned at all, you are less likely to be a human. And it's not an emphatic indicator, but it's just one more like data point that they can add to the other things. I compare that to like my email address. So, Yep. He was in Adobe. That was uh, yeah, nine years ago. He's been around for a while. This is not a brand new. It's smart. Hopefully it'll remove that requirement to do, am I a robot? Cause that is just oh, Good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> Building some of those front ends and you think, duh, do we really have to put this in here? I yeah. know. Yeah. And unfortunately we do yeah. for now. Yeah. So with that, I'm just following a conversation that we had when we last met and I found it really interesting. I've had a little bit of feedback as a result of it. So I want to continue that train of thought where we talk about the, the, if you haven't been pwned, potentially you are at more risk of being not human. With that, we would start talking about biometrics and whether it will come to the point where, because two-factor authentication is slowly becoming more broadly adopted and people are understanding the benefits of, but it still has its, especially through text message with SIM skimming and things like that. We're starting to use more biometrics and will there become a point where have I been pwned, caches, potentially hashed. I can't imagine that ever happening. I think the biometrics thing is really interesting. And if we start where the conversation often begins, we'll, we'll see where this leads. So yeah, I'll hear people say, uh, don't use biometrics because if you lose your biometrics, let's say your fingerprint is closed, you can't change it like you can a password. Well, firstly, you can change yeah. it. It's not fun, but you can. <laughs> it's like belt sanders <laughs> and things like that. But secondly, like we, we've got to recognize that th these are fundamentally different constructs. And I'll, I'll give you a really simple example. If my 12-year-old son sees someone's password, he can go and use that straight away. Like he knows how to go to a web browser and type it in. So he can easily observe it. He can easily reproduce it and he can use it to authenticate. If he sees this glass and there's a fingerprint on it, what's he got to do? First of all, he's got to watch a lot of James Bond. And then he's going to need to get like some acetone and some sticky tape. And I only know from what I see on TV, he's going to need a lot of gummy bears and a saucepan. Right? <laughs> and he's going to have to go through this whole process. And eventually he will create a prosthetic. And then he's got to get that prosthetic to work within N number of goes, depending on which device it is. Otherwise, it's going to fall back to various means of authentication, such as a pin. And if he screws that up, at least on my phone, I think it's 10 times and the whole device just wipes itself. So this is fundamentally different to a password. And then people go, the NSA could probably do that. So who are you worried about? Are you worried about the NSA? And some people are worried about the NSA. Or are you worried about your kids? The guy in the bar who's going to take it when you turn around? Uh, someone who breaks into your house? That's the stuff that the vast majority of us need to worry about. And the NSA stuff, not so much. And even then, we're still talking about very specialized tradecraft in order to do that. Even more so when you get to the modern devices with things like Face ID, which are meant to be like 20 times harder to, to fool. But we've got to start there. And then the next thing is, what is actually stored and what is actually disclosed? 
And I'm by no means an expert on this, but the bits that I understand is that, let's say I've got a fingerprint reader attached to my PC here. It is not a clean print of my fingerprint that is stored. It is a representation of that in a non-reversible fashion. Now, I imagine that's some sort of a hash that can then be compared to a fingerprint later on. I imagine it also doesn't have to be a perfect fit because you very rarely get an absolutely identically perfect thing. So what we're doing is we're looking for a process which is similar to hashing in so far as so long as we have the source and we can reproduce the process and compare to what's already in storage and you log in. So I don't see any possible way that could ever flow into Have I Been Pwned. There are data breaches in Have I Been Pwned that have had biometric data exposed. The Philippines Election Commission is the first yes. one that comes to mind. Uh, I can't do anything with it. I look at it and there's a lot of numbers in there. So, okay, we can flag that biometric data was exposed, but as to how usable it is, there's a massively questionable issue. Yeah, there's, a, there's the whole reverse engineering what that biometric looks like as a result of the representation of that. And then the rebroadcasting of that is, yeah, yeah that's just, but, I haven't read anywhere that it's been done before, but I, I stand to be corrected. I think a, a lot of what we miss with InfoSec is we get very caught up on the absolutism of security. And I've written several blog posts literally using the word absolutism. So yeah, for example, there'll be a vulnerability in a password manager, which is obscure, low impact, massively hard to exploit, gets discovered early, fixed early. And then you get people going, oh, I'd never use password. What are you going to do then? <laughs> You're just going <laughs> to use the same one everywhere. Yeah. Well, it's going to be a posty note on your monitor or something, which it's probably better than using the same one everywhere. But that is not a reason to throw the baby out sort of thing. And we've got to look at these issues and go, it's not, is this absolutely perfect, but is this the best model that we have at the moment? And I suspect where we're going with biometrics is we're going to see more and more of it. And particularly as we start to tie in with web both in and other ways of getting away from passwords, that's good. And I'd love to get more away from other means of identity assurance as well. And we've just been talking about Optus and for the viewers in other parts of the world, it's, this is our biggest data breach ever. We've got 10 million plus Aussies involved in this, a couple of million of which have had driver's license numbers, passport numbers, and Medicare numbers for a subset of those as well. So our, our like government health provider numbers. And for reasons that I can only assume a legacy, the fact that some numbers got exposed now puts identities at risk because there are all these other providers out there that are like, we just need to know that you are who you say you are. Could you please relay this short number <laughs> to us? Yeah. And once you give us the number, we'll know you're real. So maybe that's part of the problem. And we've got these devices, which are so highly sophisticated that can give us much greater levels of identity assurance. That is a much better model than what we've been doing before. We just got to make that transition. Do you think we're anywhere near ready for that transition we are in ways like we're seeing bits and pieces of it we had that uh, government voice identity identity thing for a while i'm not even sure if that's still around but it's the yeah. one where it's like in australia my voice is my id and it would look at the biometric attributes of your voice now i think also we, we've got to recognize that it, it's a little bit like there is not one single answer that does this perfectly but what we do is we tie together different attributes and we set confidence levels on the authenticity of the individual now maybe if your voice passes and you're calling from a number, which is a known good number for you. And yes, there's SIM hijacking, but then you'd also have to get the voice to pass. Yes. And then there are other attributes as well. Perhaps you're using a mobile app with geolocation and you are within 50 meters of your reg registered address. And we start to tie together all the little bits in ways that you can't just pick up a number and go, yeah, here's my driver's license number. It's really me. It's tough. And I think about it on the provider's side. They built all of these legacy systems. The uplift into transition would be a huge cost. So I would love to see that because that would make complete sense to me. There's a, an Australian company out there who we've actually had one of their reps on, it, on an episode before where they put the authentication path back in the user's hands. So if you provide your short stringed number that is your identity in Australia over the phone to, let's say, a government entity, that government entity then has a third party solution that they've got to share that to, for instance, mm. the authentication path pings the user to say, uh, X government agency has requested to share your identity number with X third party. So you can then approve that. The use case goes beyond, right? We've got a Medicare system that you mentioned here, um, which essentially has all of our ident or identifying documentation attributed to that. And if we book online a, a doctor's appointment, that then gets registered and sent to the practitioner then has five or six different systems that they will need to put that information into. 
which is third party, again, third mm. party use of our identity. But this nurse or this doctor might only need a certain part of your file history. So therefore, when the doctor tries to reach into a different part of or the practitioner's office tries to reach into a different part of, it pings a second factor authentication on your device to let you know and approve or deny. Do you think we'll ever get to that? I think we, we do bit by bit. What I think we also need to keep in mind, it's a little bit like, what, why do we still have passwords at all? And all the time I hear people go, ah, there's this password killer. I've written a blog post about this. It's, here's why insert thing here is not a password killer. Where people go, I've built this thing and I can think of several of them off the top of my head. I built this thing. It, it's technically brewing. It involves a QR code and you point your phone at it and there's no passwords, no password reuse. You know, this is going to kill passwords. And every time someone says this to me, it's like, all right, how many places are using it? Like, it's new. It's new. <laughs> no, no one yet. And I've been hearing this like the last decade. And what I think people fail to recognize, and I want to say people in our industry, what they fail to recognize is that passwords for all their flaws are such a fundamentally simple concept that everyone knows how to use it. And I just mentioned my 12 year old son, my elderly parents as well, same thing. They would struggle with 2FA and all sorts of clever biometric stuff, but they know how to enter a password. <laughs> They're great at that. So for all of these online services that are trying to welcome customers in and lower the barrier to entry, are you going to do the, the funky QR code thing with the phone that Joe, the developer has seen in his, this is really cool. Or are you going to do the thing that's just going to lower the barrier to everyone? And our challenge now is like, how do we gradually go towards technically superior solutions without leaving people behind with, without creating barriers that don't have people signing up and using services, which then pay Joe's wages so that he can build the new cool stuff. So it's, it is a little bit of a balanced thing. I think we're, we're making good progress with the web authentic stuff. We're making good progress with devices that can do very clever biometrics and things. I don't know that like logging in with Google is our best long-term <laughs> solution. <laughs> I think that raises a whole bunch of different issues, but we're moving very gradually, but it's a big shift to turn around, isn't it? Yeah, it's a massive shift to turn around, but yeah, I've got, I've got nothing but, uh, but good feelings for what's to come. I was talking to my parents about this the other day. They've got a Mac and they've got iPhone. So they're very Apple centric. Mm -hmm. And with that, they can share a lot of data between that. So it makes things a lot easier for them when they're trying to authenticate, especially to applications that might have a factored authentication path. It just, it makes life easier for them. And if we can transition it as a group policy, perhaps for some of those joined systems, I think that's going to be the easiest way to lower that barrier to entry for technically mm. superior authentication paths. Troy, I had a whole bunch of things that, that I want to ask you, but uh, we've just carried the conversation so well. One thing I do, we've just talked about Optus briefly. You broke it down so beautifully on Twitter. And I know that sounds bizarre for some of our listeners to attribute a breaking <laughs> down of a breach beautifully. But so I found it really interesting the way you broke down Optus. I'm keen on your thoughts on the Optus breach as an umbrella statement. And then for customers, I know that a lot of them listen and there's a lot of people that are concerned and it will help some of our foreign listeners as well offshore with what advice you'd give them when they do realize that they've been breached and have I been pwned or the Optus breach. I can't remember exactly what I said because it was like literally on my honeymoon and there's suddenly all these <laughs> yeah. journalists calling and my wife was like, yeah, it's, it's cool. Yeah, just, just do it. It's, you know, this, this is what you do. I said a lot of things and I was drinking a bit at the time. You're in Bali. <laughs> yeah. I, was in Bali. I wasn't drinking the wine. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. Oh, someone should have warned me about that. Crikey. Look, Optus, I think is very interesting for many reasons. In one way, it is just another day in data breach land is like, hey company got breached like stupidly simple security flaw a bunch of data got leaked out okay what's next uh, and that's the same old story over and over again even the nature of the vulnerability exposed so allegedly because they still haven't told us what yeah. so we just have to rely on infosec journalists that have spoken to the person that breached it <laughs> which seems like a reasonable place to start allegedly unauthenticated api takes a phone number as input and then returns a whole bunch of pii and then of course it's a phone number it's innumerable so it's just it's like the kids tracking watch kind of thing all over again very, very basic thing but this it just entered the public psyche and even overseas in in bali i just saw so much news on it i was still the aussie news but from everything from uh Obviously, statements from the company, statements from InfoSec experts, politicians, the prime ministers talking about it. It's all over the place. And I, I think if we were to distill perhaps the most interesting thing for me is the point we just made, which is that so much of the news was around the exposure of numbers, just personal numbers, driver's license number, Medicare number, passport number. 
And then you get all of these people lining up to change their driver's license. So we went into the into main roads here yesterday because Charlotte was changing her last name now that they're married. And they've got a sign there saying, yeah, if you're in the Optus data breach, make sure you bring the email showing in the breach so we can give you a free license. And I just find it fascinating that we are still to this day so dependent on something that is so simple, which is the same thing that we used for identity verification 20, 30, 40 years ago. Yep. And we're still using it. And I just find that fascinating. And then it starts to raise all these other issues of like, why did they have the data for so long? Why did they have it for customers from 20 years ago? Why did my friend who visited from the UK for my wedding only a month ago get an Optus SIM card and now he's in the data breach? Why did he give them my details instead of his? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> lots of interesting aspects to this. Uh, I, I think what will be most fascinating is that very often after a very public data breach, there's all this discussion of, will this be the watershed moment? Are we going to do things differently? We heard it all the time after Ashley Madison because it was such a massive incident. Are we going to do things differently now and stop the breaches? So I'm really fascinated to see what happens after this. I don't think we'll do anything differently to stop the breaches, but I'm really interested to know, will we do anything different in Australia around the requirements for identity data, the retention periods for it, and then the ability to use that to go and do evil things? I think that's going to be the, the, the big thing I'm going to be watching. It's a great, yeah, you raised a couple of really good points there. Do we get to the point of ephemeral identity number verification? We're so fixated on, I've had the same license number since I was 16. Do we get to a point where that becomes ephemeral? Every time you need to use it, there is an algorithm that changes it slightly. And it's like social security numbers in the US, right? It's like just the worst kept secret ever. You hand them out left and center to all these different places, and then you use it for identity verification. And then they end up in a data breach and everyone loses their minds for the same reason that everyone in Australia was losing their minds. It's, why are we so dependent on a number? Yeah, absolutely. So what advice would you give? And I know you get asked this question a lot because of, of how I've been pwned, but what advice do you give for people that have noted that they're in, whether it's the Optus data breach or whether it's a broader data breach that they've found themselves on have been pwned? You've got to understand what's actually been exposed. So in the, in the case of Optus, depending on who you read, there's 10 to 11 million people in total, but it sounds like for, let's say eight of those, 80% of them, it was name, email address, phone number, physical address, this sort of thing. You're not going to change any of those things. You're just going to be maybe a bit more aware of phishing, but you should be anyway, because you're in all these other data breaches that you don't even know about yeah. <laughs> all that stuff there anyway. And then for the subset, for those who have been told explicitly that yes, your passport drives us, et cetera, is exposed. Look, I mean, you can change it for free. It's not high friction. I don't know that I'd be like rushing down to your local RTA or main roads or whatever and, and doing it immediately, but it's something that I'd probably do reasonably promptly because it is low overhead, zero cost. You get the thing back. Passport numbers, I assume is going to be a bit more of a pain because there's just a massive backlog on getting passports at the moment. And then I think the, the sort of discussion about what are the things that you should be doing all the time anyway, that's my Google Nest protect. <laughs> Test. It still works. <laughs> the house is safe. <laughs> There's so much connected stuff here. Love that. What are the things you should be doing anyway? And one of the things I've been meaning for a while to just spend more time giving consideration to is what, what do the identity theft services actually do? Like, where are they good? Where are they bad? Where are the blind spots? I have used one since that early horse racing investment situation <laughs> to monitor, <laughs> read my book, yeah, to monitor yeah. uh, for any credit inquiries on my account. Now I do find that genuinely useful. And if someone was to get my identity data and go out and try and get a loan, I would get notified very quickly. And I think that that's actually a really useful thing. And I'm just curious that in the spectrum of what these organizations do, what else is there that is actually practical? I don't know, maybe they just search, have I been pwned? Have you been in a data breach or something? I guess my point is that there is some value to these services and it's up to people to decide if that's sufficient value for them to pay their however many bucks a month for it. Yeah, oh, that's a good point. And, and along with that, there's the basics, right? There's just scrub yourself, your digital self, make sure that you understand where you sit digitally. I talk to people a lot about simple things, password manager. It's just the basis of having good hygiene there. The password manager will tell you if you shared that password. Some of them will even tell you if it's been breached before. I know the Apple products tell you if your passwords have been breached as uh, something with that too. So if you cache your passwords in your iOS device, then it will let you know that you've been, and I assume that points back to the Have I Been Pwned database. 
I don't know. Uh, like, I genuinely don't know because they could have downloaded the data and used it there. I have heard people say that they have some passwords that have been pwned, doesn't? So, you know, that they obviously have their own sources. But Apple does that one password built in, not just password searches, but email address searches very quickly. In fact, after that, I joined their, their board of advisors. But one, one of the things I did, full disclosure. So one of the things <laughs> that they did really quickly is when I first launched the password search with the anonymity model, like a couple of days later, it was in one password. And I was just like, whoa, <laughs> how'd, how'd, how'd that happen? That's really cool. Yeah. And, and look, there are many organizations that have their own sources of passwords or even credential pairs, which is another can of worms altogether, that will alert people very early on. So, you know, they're good too. They're all like little parts of the ecosystem of protecting people. Yeah, absolutely. Some good advice there. Look, what keeps Troy Hunt up at night for future concerns? Let's talk about your kids, the next generations to come. What keeps you up at night for potential concerns with, uh, with the future of whether it's identity or whether it's just InfoSec more broadly? I got to be honest, like I, I get kept up at night, but not because I'm worried, because I'm excited. I just think it's yeah. a super, super cool industry to be in a super cool time. And yeah, especially for my son now, he'll be 13, geez, in less than a week. <laughs> yeah, he's getting to that age where he's like, he's yeah, thinking about careers and he says he wants to do what I do. Mostly because I take him to cool conferences and it's just yeah. all like beer and Skittles. I think for someone interested in this industry now, we know that there's like a massive skills shortage. We know that it's getting, that the stakes are getting higher and higher. It's getting more and more interesting. We're getting more things around us that can break and go wrong. I am kept awake just thinking about how exciting it is and yeah, I guess particularly when I've just come back, having refreshed my mind for a little while as well, I just look at all this stuff around me and go, I'd love to do that and that and that because there's just so many amazing things. And stuff like cloud just makes it all so much more achievable in, in terms of time and money and overhead. I guess in, in terms of what worries me, I think things like this identity verification are really fascinating. I think things like how do we better do monitoring of identity theft and this kind of thing is really important but yeah look i'm, honest, I'm just more excited than worried i just think it's a super cool time yeah i totally agree and a lot of our guests have said the same that it's it's one of the most exciting times where we've had a long time of of limited innovation in terms of big innovation but with the uplift in technology and the technologies available to us today the innovations are going to really start driving that hockey stick curve and you only need to look at things like uh, some of elon musk's brands and some of the mm. things that they're doing just to get back into space it's it's a super exciting time and for our generations the younger generations of our kids i think they've got such an opportunity it's just about yeah. maximizing their youth in consuming the technology and working out where to go with it yeah, yeah, no, totally. Good times. Yeah, absolutely. Look, Troy, I know that your time is completely valuable. So we generally wrap up our podcast episodes with a question. And the question is, if you had the entire world's population's attention for 30 minutes, you had 30 minutes to talk to the world's population and provide some messaging off the top of your head, what would that be? Oh, don't all use Have I Been Pwned at once. I'm not sure how that'll go. Buy my book. <laughs> <No. Yeah>. <laughs> 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 I, look, I, I think there's just so many fundamentals that the broader population just doesn't get right at the moment that makes such a massive difference. How many times do we see phishing work, data breaches occur because of password reuse? People not using 2FA. Oh, but the thing now, it's like there's 2FA. We're just going to keep bombarding them with challenges until they get sick of it. And they just yeah. go, yes. <laughs> I'd love to talk to them about just getting those basic fundamental things right. And they don't fix everything, but it's the rising tide kind of thing. It just makes it harder across the board. And of the subset of those of us that are building systems, I'd love to talk about the human accessibility of things. I just mentioned passwords live on because they're so easy to use. And the funky QR code scanning thing with your mobile app to get rid of passwords doesn't work because humans don't like it. 2FA adoption rates are enormously low because the UX just totally sucks. Yeah, YubiKeys and U2F and everything are wonderful. They're fantastic. I love them. They still remain a barrier to entry. Try doing it with a mobile device, a you know, cryptographic device that you've literally got in your pocket or the watch or things like that. So making it more and more accessible for people and not looking for the absolute perfect solution, but what kind of moves us gradually in the right direction. And you know, to use that analogy from before, like gradually turns the ship around. So I think I'd speak to those two audiences in different ways about those things. 
So I really enjoy that. There's a lot of value for the world's population in that sentiment. So I think that would be really valued across the world's population. So if you do get 30 minutes, I'll be tuning in. Well, obviously I'll be tuning in part of the population, but I think it would be really cool. Look, Troy, is there anything that you want to leave the audience with, whether it's advice or whether it's any last comments before we wrap the show up? No, look, I think it's just been fun. It's been a very casual chat. For everyone's reference, we didn't rehearse any of this. It's all off the cuff. But that's kind of like the best talks. I think it's it, it, particularly at a time where we still don't spend as much time traveling around and being face-to-face -face with people, being able to do stuff like this and hopefully make it a bit interesting and engaging is awesome. So thanks for the opportunity, mate. No, absolutely. Look, for our listeners, Pwned by Troy Hunt is available. It is self-published, so I'll make sure that the links are all below. I believe it's bookbytroyhunt.com. Book.troyhunt.com. Book .troy I haven't even got around to putting something on my blog about it, so I really need to do <laughs> We'll link all of them below. And if you don't follow Troy on Twitter and all the socials, please do. It is a valued connection to have on there. So Troy, thanks so much for your time. We really appreciate it. This is episode 25 of Dark Mode, signing off with Troy Hunt. Thank you, Troy. Thanks, mate.